you know, we're talking about young adults, but young adults started out as young children. And these young adults, if we don't treat them, then become middle-aged adults that are now raising younger children that are still depressed. So I like to think about it slightly broader. And um, that, you know, when we're treating sort of almost any age group, we're treating the family and supporting the family. And that translates into young adults in particular as well. One of the things that I think is notable that, you know, and I appreciate Dr. Boresin mentioning the environment, because the reality is, is, and I've said this for years, Dr. Boresin knows this, I can't treat someone's depression if, I, if they can't be fed. I can't treat their anxiety if they don't know how they're going to make rent. So we cannot disentangle mental health, mental wellness uh, from social determinants of health. They live in the same Petri dish. And, you know, all of my tricks as a psychologist fall on deaf ears if somebody's worried about, is mom going to be able to, are we going to be homeless? Or, you know, can mom, can, do we have enough diapers for the new baby that's just arrived? I just, I can't impress enough how important it is that we, we have to look um, in, in a much broader scope. Chelsea was one of the uh, hardest hit communities for anyone in this area. They, real, they knew it was all over the news. Um, in terms of COVID. And one of the things that we did experience was the power of the community during a very, very trying time. We had one of the highest rates of, of COVID contraction per capita of any almost anywhere except for Navajo Nation in, in the United States. And one of the things that happened was <clears throat> truly immediately, the city convened a mental health task force. So it involved people like myself, other care delivery systems within the community, but as well as grassroots organizations that were addressing the social determinants of health, because again, we can't disentangle that. And we met every day. There were about 20 of us in the community that met every day. What do we need? What do we have to do? And I think that, you know, we don't have to meet every day, but some of these same education, some of the same things that we've done, I think continue to be important because the crisis might not be the COVID pandemic that we're all, you know, that we were all a part of, but there are pandemics or and you know, that are still happening in these underserved communities, such as housing issues, such as as uh, you know, food insecurity. So all of these things are still happening, and I think we need to keep keep talking about it, not just under the valence of COVID. Uh, so this emergency, you know, mental health emergency team, we did an, a, a, quite a lot of, uh, we had a lot of activities that we were participated in, you know, resource sharing, who's got this, who needs this, I just talked to a family, they're in need of this, somebody, the schools need this. So there was a lot of resource sharing, there was a lot of education, we did our staff at MGH, as well as other places, you know, other other pockets in the community, many Facebook lives on educating, you know, what to be afraid of, what not to be afraid of. How do you talk to your kids? How do you talk to your teens? How do you manage social media during this time with your teens? You know, how can families construct themselves? How do you get a kid on Zoom to go to school? Uh, and also wellness, you know, some wellness and, and stress management, anxiety reduction, kinds of videos. So we were putting them on YouTube. We were putting it on the city's Facebook Live. And that involved both, both the mental health department and pediatrics. Also, we worked on logistics. I mean, I, th I think the health, our health center alone donated uh, through all of the employees over 15,000 diapers. Because if, if in case people don't know, the, your food stamp, the EBT card does not work for diapers. So if you can't work and you have a new baby and you have an EBT card, you, you, you don't have diapers. Now we have a public health issue. So again, we can't disentangle. One of the projects that I was uh, part, one of the architects of that was really, really exciting was we identified pretty quickly uh, sort of the disparity around digital, um, digital access. Uh, and yeah, I'm not gonna go on about that. I think everyone's heard about that or read about it. But it, it, there's no question that the the, the pandemic uh, laid bare the, the disparity in terms of access to to Wi-Fi and other um, other uh, digital access issues. So one of the things that we did was we got some tablets donated, 
And we said, that's great. We can do our patient visits because we have these, you know, hundreds of tablets that have been delivered. So we construct this program about distribution and all of that and then realize, wait a minute, people don't have Wi-Fi. Wait a minute, people don't know how to use this. People don't know how to how, how to access or let, set up their patient gateway, the you know the portal to to your healthcare. So we what we did, which was really exciting, is we we enlisted high school students to do this and help us uh, be the basically the tech gurus for all of the people in the community, some seniors, some middle aged that that didn't know how to set up into the patient gateway. So we, we utilized our teens to do that. They felt fantastic. They felt like they were, again, purposeful, as Jean mentioned. They felt like they had a role. They felt like they were doing something to help. And I think for all of us, those are qualities that we all strive to do and strive to have in our lives. Um, and that was a really amazing program. We also did a very similar program, but not with technology, but around really um, intense support for pregnant women and new, um, newly uh, prenatal in, in terms of prenatal care and working with moms so that we could stave off uh, postpartum depression. Jean referenced the, the, the importance of the community. And one of the things that I would have to say is, although Chelsea has many, many needs, it also has somewhat of an embarrassment of riches and that there are many resources that are of like mind. And there's been an ongoing uh, effort of, for many years to be a trauma-informed community. Part of what we have done in, in Chelsea is for many, for, almost, for 25 years, we had a PACT program, which was a police action counseling team. So for families involved with domestic violence, and that involved young children, young adults, teens, uh, we had a social worker that actually rode with the police and would go out um, after the de-escalation and be able to do immediate interventions with families. So everyone like, thinks, oh, that's great. We helped the kids. We didn't just help the kids. We helped the community because on those ride-alongs, that social worker is talking to that police officer saying, this is what happens to kids when this happens. This is what happens to families when these events happen. If we don't do something, this is what happens. And over time, we were able to create such an incredibly strong relationship with the Chelsea Police Department that I know if I have to call them today and have a concern about, um, you know, a particular family and exposure to domestic violence, I know they are going to treat that situation, that family, with a level of trauma-informed policing that is not available in most communities. So, and, and we are a community of color most communities of color are not gonna call the police and we, all, we, we don't have to talk about the reasons why. Additionally, we have a group that met, meets weekly to identify every, you know, any at-risk family. So it might be someone with serious mental illness that has gone off their meds and is you know, wandering around the community. And this is also a, a, a weekly meeting of like-minded community leaders and, of, of various factions of how from the housing department, from DCF, from uh, DDS, from DMH, from Mass General, from other you know community organizations that come together and say, okay, how can we help this at-risk family? How can we intervene to this kid is on the edge of joining a gang? What can we do? 